Howdy folks, hope you're all having a good one, and welcome back to World of Warships with Rear Admiral Jingles, where today we have a highly unusual battle for you for all different kinds of reasons. Not least of which the ship that our hero, Nino Kasaka, is sailing. The Coronel Bolognate... what the hell is that? Well that's a good question, but don't worry, we'll get on to that later. For a start though, let's just take a quick look at the matchmaking. Uh, it's the new map, Seychelles. Not really sure what's going on there, but that's the least weird thing about this matchmaking. Probably one of the most unusual things is there's no actual aircraft carrier in play. And I checked, the matchmaker didn't sneak a hybrid in under the radar, because I think at this kind of level, tier 7 maximum, uh, the only hybrid available is the Japanese Issei, and it's not here. So that's the good news, no carrier. Especially good news for this ship, we'll explain why in greater detail later. But the bad news is, of course, well, you've probably already seen it, triple submarine. Oh great, fantastic. The even worse news is the fail division on Nina's team. There are two tier 4 cruisers in this tier 7 battle. Now the thing you need to remember about those two cruisers, the Dane and the Kuma, is that at tier 4 you get protected matchmaking. There's no two tier spread at tier 4 and below, it's one tier only. Which means those two cruisers should never see a tier 7 battle. Hell, they should never see a tier 6 battle. But they are in this tier 7 battle because the idiots have divisioned up with a tier 5 battleship, the Koenig. So fully 20% of Nina's team are three tiers below the matchmaking spread. <laughs> it's all their own fault. Oh, and 30% of both teams are submarines. But hey, on the bright side, at least there's no aircraft carrier. And as I said, that's particularly good news for Nina in this ship, the Coronel Bolognese. What the hell is the Coronel Bolognese? Because it kind of looks like a Fiji, except the Fiji that's been messed around with, and that's exactly what it is. I mean, I had to look it up, because World of Warships is rapidly approaching the same stage as World of Tanks, where I just don't know what half the vehicles involved are. This is, in fact, the former HMS Ceylon, and it's a Crown Colony cruiser just like the Fiji. But you probably noticed by looking at the back end of the ship that it is not just like the Fiji. Congratulations, it isn't. They've taken the Fiji, a tier 7 Crown Colony class light cruiser, an excellent cruiser, and they have buffed it and at the same time made it worse. <laughs> because they've removed one of the main gun batteries and replaced it with anti-aircraft guns. In theory, buffing the AA, and yet, at the same time, making the AA worse. This ship has the third worst long-range AA <laughs> of any Tier 7 cruiser in the game. Worse even than the Fiji, upon which this thing is based. How do you fuck that up? <laughs> well, there are all different kinds of ways that you can fuck that up. First, you take away... 25% of the ship's firepower by removing one of the main gun battery turrets and replacing it with AA that basically doesn't do anything, and in fact nerfs the long-range AA. Then you take away the smoke screen. Yes, it doesn't get a smoke screen. It also doesn't get high explosive shells, armor piercing only, and while it does get a hydro consumable, it's, it's sort of a nerfed hydro consumable, because for a start it's not the British cruiser hydro, it's the British destroyer hydro. You know, the British destroyers, as well as having Lots of very short duration, uh, but quick recharging smoke screens. They also have a sort of really good self-defense hydro. It doesn't have very long range, only about three to three and a half kilometers, but it lasts forever. Well, they've given it that hydro, except they've nerfed that too. It doesn't last forever, it only lasts a hundred seconds. So, <laughs> so they've, they've basically taken the amazing HMS Fiji, they've nerfed its gun firepower by 25%, they've taken its smoke away and they've given it a shit hydro, right? <laughs> and then they've packaged it up and sold it to Peru. But at least it did exist, which is more than you can say about the Almirante Cochrane over there, which is about to not exist because it's given broadside to, well, even though it's a nerfed Fiji, it is still a Fiji, so... <laughs> And never actually existed in the first place anyway. Because the Almirante Cochrane, which now definitely doesn't exist, and there's the first Blood Award, although I'm pretty sure the Kuma over there, remember a tier 4 cruiser in a tier 7 battle, is very, very quickly about to not exist either. But, well, at least the Kuma did exist, unlike the Almirante Cochrane, which was what would happen if Chile had ordered cruisers from Italy. 
To be completely fair, the Chilean Navy was considering at the time, in the mid-1930s, purchasing a bunch of cruisers either from Italy or the Royal Navy, and then did neither, and instead just bought a bunch of destroyers and a battleship from the Royal Navy. So why the Almirante Cochrane is in the game, I have no idea. But it's not in this battle anymore, because it's dead. As is the enemy Eendracht over there, sunk by one of the many submarines in this battle. Right. You know, I don't want to give you the impression that the Coronel Bolognese here is a bad ship. I mean, it is basically just a heavily nerfed Fiji. But, I mean, that says more about the Fiji than it does about the Coronel Bolognese here, because if you can take a Tier 7 cruiser, nerf the shit out of it, give it a new name and put it back in the game at the same tier, and it's still a pretty good ship. I mean, that probably says more about the Fiji than it does about this thing. This is not a bad ship. It's just not as good as the Fiji. The Fiji is awesome. The Fiji actually reminds me a bit of the Cleveland, the US Navy Tier 8 light cruiser, because it used to be the US Navy Tier 6 light cruiser, and the only thing they changed when they pushed it up two tiers was to give it a bit more health. <laughs> and it's still a really good Tier 8 light cruiser. So you can imagine just how ridiculous it was when it was at Tier 6. Oh, I don't know if you noticed there, they were six seconds exactly away from flipping this cap circle. Then one of the tier four, in fact, the only surviving tier four light cruisers in the Fell Division, the Dan A, decided he doesn't want to win after all, and he sailed out of the cap circle. So it took them even longer to flip it, but flip it they have. And there is definitely an enemy submarine. There it is. There's his sonar ping. So Nina calls in the depth charge airstrike, and that's actually moderately realistic, because while Crown Colony class cruisers never had depth charges, they did have catapult aircraft. Two Supermarine Walrus float planes. I don't know if the Ceylon class had them fitted, and I know that all of the Crown Colony class cruisers had them removed by 1944, because they were more of a liability than anything else. HMS Liverpool, the town class cruiser, had her bows blown off when a torpedo hit her, detonating the aviation fuel store, putting the ship out of action for an entire year. I suspect Nina wishes they had the depth charges right now, though. I mean, these aircraft do have a minimum range. Then again, so do the torpedoes. Not that the cachalot would be able to torpedo Nina anyway, because Nina is undetected. <laughs> I mean, how the fuck does that work? <laughs> You've got a cruiser running right over the top of a submarine. You don't need hydrophones to detect the cruiser. The crew of the submarine would be able to hear it, but the cruiser's undetected. Because World of Warships reasons. <laughs> and yet I think that's fair. Now wait, hear me out. Yes, it's complete bollocks, but it is fair within the context of World of Warships, because if you look at it from the other perspective, the cruiser could be running hydro, you know, the thing that's designed and invented to detect submarines and yet still not detect the submarine, even if the cruiser was directly over the top of the submarine, if that submarine in this game was at maximum depth. So, yes, that's also complete bollocks, but at least it's fair, because it works both ways. It's probably no great surprise to hear that I'm not a huge fan of submarines in World of Warships. I mean, they are the literal definition of hammering a square peg into a round hole. The contortions that Wargaming had to put submarines through in order to get them even remotely playable within the context of a surface warfare warship game. They had to stretch the capabilities of actual submarines way beyond the confines of actual reality. Let's not forget, most of these submarines, I mean, World War II submarines weren't actually submarines, they were submersibles. They operated on the surface most of the time and they only submerged when they needed to evade detection or they were going to attack. Most of the time they actually operated on the surface at night, and the reason for that was because when they were submerged, they were really fucking slow. Like, seven knots slow. So you take that seven knots submerged, dead if it's ever caught on the surface square peg, and then you have to try to hammer it into the... all the battles take place in broad daylight, and pretty much everything else is going to be doing speeds in excess of 30 knots round hole. And you end up with submarines in World of Warships that can go faster submerged than they can on the surface, <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> that have homing torpedoes that they never had, just in order to make them not the worst thing imaginable to play or play against. 
and they're still not great to play against, but, you know, they are at least, and I can't believe that I'm actually going on record and going to be able to be quoted as saying this, they are at least moderately balanced versus the surface ships. Because while there is a lot of bullshit surrounding the implementation of submarines into World of Warships, unlike with the aircraft carriers, the bullshit does at least work both ways. Yes, it can be frustrating while running hydro directly on top of a submarine and still not being able to detect it. But at the same time, there are circumstances where you can be right on top of a submarine that is detected and it can't detect you in return. So, it's fair. It's utter bollocks, but at least it's fair. Anyway, this Omaha. You know, for a Tier 5... I mean, this is the absolute worst matchmaking that an Omaha is ever going to have. Tier 5 cruisers are infamous for just exploding the second anybody so much as even looks at them. And the Omaha is probably the poster child for Tier 5 cruisers in that respect. But he is managing to do really well. I suspect he'd be doing a lot better if he was actually loading the armour piercing. Because, I mean, the Fiji... sorry... The Coronel Bolognese may be two tiers higher, but it is still just a light cruiser, just like the Omaha. And they're both armed with the same calibre of guns. And while Nina doesn't have any option but to fire on the piercing, because he doesn't have high explosive, the Omaha has the choice. And yet he continues to just fire high explosive at everything, even when he's got the broadside of other light cruisers to shoot at. And he could be doing that. <laughs> But I don't think I ever see him fire anything but high explosive. Then again, I mean, you know, he's only shooting at other light cruisers, and 6-inch high explosive does do a lot of damage to light cruisers. You're never going to citadel anything. Well, except maybe something particularly badly armoured, like, oh, I don't know, the Tier 4 light cruiser from the Fail Division that he's shooting at, the Dane. There are even some Tier 5 light cruisers that you can citadel with... Um, 152mm high explosive. The Emerald. I know I've scored Citadel hits on the Emerald with 6 inch high explosive. I'm pretty sure you can Citadel the Tier 4 Kuma with 6 inch high explosive as well. Possibly it may also work on the Tier 4 Danae, which is what that Omaha is currently shooting at and doing surprisingly well. I mean, he took a couple of nasty hits from Nina here, but he's doing a really good job of kiting away from and defending that cap circle down to the south. The thing about the Omaha that you have to remember, and which a lot of Omaha players never seem to learn, is that yes, it is an incredibly fragile ship, prone to just detonating and exploding in a shower of sparks the second it gets hit by an armor-piercing shell, because it is just made out of citadels and fuel. But it's fast and it has great firepower. Well, hang on a second, is he going to be able to save the submarine from the Farragut over there? I think he might have left it a little bit too late. Oh yeah, there's all kinds of, yeah, the submarine's done. If the Farragut doesn't get it, the depth charges will. Oh, more bullshit, it got torpedoed by an enemy submarine. So as well as the Farragut and the Koenig, there is also an enemy submarine over there. And the Farragut really probably should be taking this opportunity to chill the hell out, but instead he's choosing violence. So with any luck, he'll be dead soon. Nina narrowly missing a submarine thing there. But I'm, I need to finish what I was saying about the Omaha, because it's worth saying, and I'm just going to get sidetracked. So, yeah, very, very fragile Tier 5 cruiser, but it's fast and has a lot of firepower. Now, critics of the Omaha will be very quick to point out, and they are, in fairness, absolutely correct, that while the Omaha is fast and it does have a lot of guns, because of the way those guns are arranged, it only actually has two turrets, one at the front, one at the back. Oh, there goes the Farragut, nice. Uh, most of the guns on the Omaha are actually arranged in casemates down the side of the ship, which means that even though on paper it has a lot of guns, it can never get slightly more than half of those guns shooting at a target. So lots and lots of guns that most of the time it can't actually bring to bear on whatever it's shooting at. And that's true, but the thing is you're looking at it from the wrong direction, because while that is true, what it actually means is that the Omaha can always get up to half of its guns firing at whatever it's shooting at. Unlike ships that have turrets, where the second they start turning and circling, suddenly the guns are all pointing the wrong direction and you have to wait for either the ship to turn, or the turrets to turn, or both. The Omaha never has that problem, because no matter which way it turns, it's got a whole bunch of guns that are ready and waiting to shoot at you. So the tactic in the Omaha is to just keep kiting and turning, and keep that barrage of fire up. Sure, you're never firing all of your guns at the same target, but you're firing most of your guns at the same target all of the time. Which is pretty much what that enemy Omaha has been doing. And is why he survived this long, and it's only now 
that Nina's team have actually managed to flip that cap. The Omaha's been playing really well. Ooh, this isn't good though. Look at those homing torpedoes. And by some miracle, he only took one of them. Those submarines, and there are still two of them left, are definitely going to be a problem. The Koenig over there, however, probably not. And while it might look like Nina is committing the cardinal sin of turning to give flat broadside to a battleship at point-blank range in a light cruiser, he's actually reasonably safe because that battleship has no idea what he's doing. He's firing high explosive. Let's not forget, that is the battleship who divisioned up with a pair of tier 4 cruisers and ended up dragging them into a tier 7 battle. The torpedoes, on the other hand, are much more dangerous. Although now he only has to worry about one submarine because he just got a double strike taken out, one of them and the battleship at the same time. That just leaves one enemy submarine and the Omaha, who if it hadn't been for the fail division on Nina's team would have been bottom tier in a light cruiser in a tier 7 battle and yet is one of the last two ships left alive. The fact that that Omaha is still alive and still fighting is probably the reason why its team are doing as badly as they are because when you're in a tier 7 battle and your entire team is being carried by a tier 5 light cruiser who's only just gone down after 15 minutes of battle you're probably destined to fail. <laughs> that just leaves the one submarine a U-69 who briefly got caught on the surface. He must have just popped up for a gulp of air and now he's doing an emergency dive. But hey, guess what? The depth charge attack planes are ready to go. Oh, and it's probably worth pointing out, something that I probably should have pointed out way earlier than this, is that the not Fiji does have a combat instruction. You probably heard it ratcheting up and he's just used it. Every time you score a main gun battery hit on something with this ship, it charges up that combat instruction, which drastically reduces the cooldown on all of your consumables. Cooldowns like the depth charge attack planes and the hydro. All of which pretty much means that that U-69 has seconds to live. And then just to add insult to injury, they get the Kraken Unleash, they get the fifth kill, but they don't get it with the depth charges, they don't even get it with the main gun batteries, they get it with the secondaries. <laughs> it's a secondary kill in a cruiser, which means that Nina Kasako proper in the not Fiji, also known as the Coronel Bolognese, finishes that battle not just with the first blood, the high caliber, the Kraken Unleashed, the devastating strike, the Confederate, but also the Close Quarters Expert Award from exactly four secondary gun battery hits. <laughs> Considering the colossal fail division on their team, with that Koenig dragging a pair of tier 4 light cruisers into a tier 7 battle, that's a pretty impressive carry. Although perhaps not quite as impressive a carry as the doomed to fail Omaha on the enemy team, who finished head and shoulders above the rest of his team in a tier 7 battle, by the way. Unfortunately, the tier 7, because there was only one tier 7 on each team, the tier 7 on his team was the Eendracht. And while it is a tier 7 cruiser, it's not a very good tier 7 cruiser. It's kind of shit. Something that you absolutely cannot say about the Coronel Bolognese, because even though it is basically just a heavily nerfed Fiji at the same tier as the Fiji, it's still pretty damn good. Does that mean that the Fiji is a bit overpowered and needs a nerf? Well, yeah, probably, but don't worry, it's fine. It ain't gonna happen. Nobody from Wargaming has been paying attention to any of my videos for years. The only way the Fiji is gonna get a nerf is if they take it out of the game nerf the shit out of it, and then put it back in as a premium one tier higher, <laughs> right? <laughs> so until that happens, the Fiji's going to be fine. And so's the Coronel Bolognese. Hope you enjoyed today's battle, and as always, take care, and I'll catch you next time.